men. The uh, subject of salt and light is something that's probably had more sermons preached on it than I think many of the other themes of the Bible. But uh, today it's come up in our reading. It's interesting Jesus didn't teach about salt. He simply issued a challenge. What he's saying is it's down to you. God so loved the world he sent Jesus Christ. We were thinking it was down to him. But the consequence of that, the consequence of our faith is that then he has that mission for us. I spoke briefly uh, uh, the other week on uh, the call of God. Paul's call to be an apostle and the call to us to be saints, that is to be holy. The call to the life of holiness. Holiness is the focus, it should be the focus of Christian life. Too much we get focused on what we do and there are things that we do of course as Christians. But it's God's plan for us to be holy in as much as we can then have fellowship with him. Not only now, but in the time to come. That is his retirement plan for each one of us. But Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. And Job asked the question in chapter 6 of that book. He said, can flavourless food be eaten without salt? And Jesus had something of that thought in mind when he's spoken that to his disciples. Salt has a couple of obvious uses, uh, the first of which is as a flavour enhancer, that if you put the salt in in the right place in the meal, then it draws out the natural flavours. It, it causes the meal to be richer. I praise God I'm married to a good cook. I don't have to think too much about that. But I can cook two things. I can cook porridge and I can cook gravy. Don't be laughing. I can cook proper gravy. Both of those, although you don't put, I know you don't put the gravy with the porridge, I know that. But if you put the salt in at the right time, the right amount of salt at the right time, you get the nicest, richest porridge. And then you can eat it the way you choose. And if you're a Scot, you'll sprinkle more salt on it and just eat it like that. Uh, you might, well I'm a brown sugar man myself, perhaps you like honey, perhaps whatever. But without that salt, it's bland. You can still eat it, you can get by, but if you really enjoy your porridge, you want that to be cooked properly. Gravy's the same, there's no point in putting the salt into the gravy after you've made the roux as they called it and then um, put the flour in and, and, and then go, oh, I forgot the salt. It'll always taste like bland gravy with salt in it. It's a matter of timing. Is that right? You've got to get it right in, in cooking. That if you put too much salt in, it's inedible. I have made that mistake without getting and banging in about that all day. The thing is that it's a flavour enhancer that our society, without our Christ-likeness in it, never achieves its potential. You can't just go in and be religious on top of people after they've mucked it all up. We are here about enhancing and about bringing change. The other major use for salt is as a preservative. Salt was highly valued back in pre-refrigeration days for just that. It stops food from rotting. Uh, meat and vegetables can be pickled in brine and so they would keep, particularly in the cooler northern hemisphere, they would keep uh, for, for months in fact over the winter time. And you would know that old expression about having money salted away. It's put somewhere safe. It'll still be there when you want it if it's salted away. But our salt is our Christ-like character. The reason that Christ died on the cross, the reason that we come to faith, isn't for people to think, well, you're a nice bloke. And I guess we should be nicer because we're Christians. But that's not the focus. People didn't think I was a nice bloke when I became a Christian people in the world. They just thought I was nuts. And that's a more realistic expectation because they can't make the connection about what God has done because they don't understand what God requires. They don't understand about holiness. The picture of holiness that many people have is that old pre-reformation picture where, and in fact it's, uh, it's spoken about in the Isaiah reading, is this the fast that I've desired to go around with your head bowed like a reed and your hands joined and looking in that one of those pale wan images towards heaven looking for all the world that a, a slight breeze would blow you over because you're so heavenly focused that is not 
at Christ's character. Christ stood up to the world. And there's something about us that needs to stand up to the world. We need to stand as followers of Jesus Christ. That when they see the way that we act, they would know that there's something different and not just being a nice bloke. We're talking about something different because when you give the explanation for the blessed hope that lies in you, you will say it's because of Jesus. I remember years ago, um, the man who gave me my first start in Bellingen, a man who helped me to be prospered in Bellingen, uh, a sawmiller, uh, Tommy O'Connor, and I remember when I stopped drinking and boozing, he said, oh, come down to the pub, we'll do that. And I said, no, it's okay, Tom. I go to church now, is all I said. And I walked away feeling absolutely crushed. I thought, that was as weak as water. Well, I was a very young Christian. Going to church isn't an excuse for anything. It's not a good reason for anything. Going to church is what Christians do. The reason the change came into our lives is because of Jesus Christ. We're here to acknowledge him in all that we do. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will guide your path. So too often, when our soliness loses its taste and its tang and its ability to preserve or to enhance the flavour, Jesus said it's worth nothing but to be tipped out and trampled underfoot. And the problem is so often that we have allowed the name of Jesus to become seemingly worthless to people and it's been cast aside as some bit of rubbish and trampled underfoot in the world. And we know that that happens down the street. We know that that happens in our workplaces. This happens in our schools now. It is taught as rubbish. It is taught as something of no value. And the reason for that is because we've not stood up. We need to stand up and that salt needs to reflect the character of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, you are the light of the world. And he said that in a pre-electric age where the light was a little oil lamp running on olive oil with a little piece of flax that was twisted and lit and carefully teased. I guess it was worth one candle power, certainly worth one match. It just burned a bit longer. But I recall many years ago when I first moved to Bellingen and we lived, I lived out in the bush and I was working and I used to knock off about six and I had to go home and it had been pouring with rain and it was a new moon, it was dark, it was a cloudy sky anyway, there wasn't a star and I had to park my car a mile and a half from home and walk home down a bush track and I didn't have a torch with me. So I've set off from the car and eventually your eyes do get used, I, I don't have bad night vision so I was able, you could just see from time to time enough track to walk down and at some stage I knew I could hear the rushing of the water because it was quite a, a vigorous flow of the creek there and there was a narrow bridge to go over. And I'd gone three, maybe 400 yards and it's in pitch black and there was a, the, the right angle corner that took you down to the bridge had a bank of earth thrown up by the grater. And in the pitch darkness I could see for the first time tiny little neon blue fluorescent mushrooms that I'd never seen before. And there they were, there were hundreds of them just lining that bit of bank saying go that way. They were tiny pinpricks of light but in the darkness they shone so brightly and in fact they shone in the darkness because that's what fluorescent plants do. And it guided me home. And it just reminds me, when I read this here, Jesus is saying we need to be like that. When we think, well, I've got nothing to offer. I'm nobody. Well, you're on the right track. That is correct. Unless it's only who we are in Christ that gives us our identity. It's only who we are in Christ that gives us the, the, the empowerment to be something to somebody else that's of use in eternity. And it's only in Christ that we become the light of the world. In John's Gospel, uh, chapter 1, verse 9, the, John speaks of Jesus as the true light which gives light to every man. Now, he's returned to be with the Father, but through us, he still shines today. So that when people are groping through life in the darkness, which they are out there, deep darkness covering the world, when they come across us, we'll be like those little blue lights 
shining away in the darkness there, pointing the way, keeping you safe along the way. That's what we're here for. And, and more than that, people will be attracted to the fact that even in darkness you shine, even in, even in deep darkness you can be seen and there's something different and something attractive about your Christ-likeness that will draw them to Jesus and not to you. They're not going to say, well, you're a bright spark, I'll follow you. But there'll be a reason why you're shining. The purpose is to say, what a miracle-working God. The purpose is to give glory to our Father in heaven. We have no business hiding his light. A light is not hid under a bushel measure, we used to say. You don't get a light and stick it under a tent or under a bucket. There's no point. You might as well turn the light out. And in fact, that's what Jesus is saying. When you hide your light, your light is turned out. Jesus did not, he said, he did not come to do away with Old Testament law. In fact, Jesus came to set the bar a bit higher for us. And this is how the light starts to shine. He said not one jot, that's all, not one iota of the Old Testament, not one comma, not one exclamation mark will be done away, but everything will be there until it is fulfilled. And Jesus came not to do away with it, but to fulfill its requirements. Jesus came to fill the gap between what you can do by being a nice person and the righteousness that God requires for us. A gap we could never cross on our own. But he has come and hung on the cross for us. In Isaiah 58 in our Old Testament reading, the prophet is, has been commanded by the Lord, tell my people that they are sinning. Tell them how they are sinning. They know something is wrong. These people are going through the motions of spirituality. They're attending temple, they're attending synagogue, they're praying, they're fasting, but nothing's happening. And in fact, if you look at the context of Isaiah's life, they are rapidly heading towards Assyria where they, and Babylon, where they are going to be taken captive. They are going to be removed from their land and taken as a captive people and when I was reading that and thinking about that during the week, how relevant to us today. They were being taken to that very place where the challenge to the world is today. And they were going, oh, we're praying, oh, we're going to church, oh, we're doing this stuff, but God's not listening. And the answer lies in here. The answer is the same here as it was then. The answer is also, I guess, given in, in us being salt and being light. Because none of this will pass away, Jesus said. All will be fulfilled in him. And so he's saying that they're asking the question, why have we fasted and, and, and you have not seen? See, there are people who, who think that they're drawing close to God and yet they're just acting out their religion. They're eager for God to come close and to answer prayer. But in fact, they're just taking their sin to the synagogue. They're taking their sin to the temple. It's important to know that all men, all women of any age, of any sexual persuasion, of any dark and heinous crime, of any background, of any theological or spiritual belief are welcome in church. This is important to know. Nobody is excluded. People should come. We should invite people with confidence to church. But they're invited to hear the gospel. They're invited because God changes lives. This is not the only place. This isn't the factory where they come in one door and go out the other changed. But this is a place where the gospel is preached. This should be a place where Jesus Christ is held in the highest regard. This should be a place where the gathering of the people who are salt and who are light will influence the people who are not. That they might begin to see that there is a light that shines in the darkness, that brings change, that is different because it's God at work in us. They're fasting. The problem with the fasting of these folk that Isaiah is prophesying to was they thought that their fasting would impress God. 
They thought lying in sackcloth and ashes and going around mining and tearing their clothing would, would, would affect God. God would go, oh, look at that, that's terrible. These poor people, I need to answer their prayer. But in fact, the purpose of fasting and the purpose of prayer and the purpose of worship is to change us. Because God never changes. Nothing you can do is going to change God's mind about things. As you fast, as you humble yourself, as you seek his face, as you read his word, as you allow and invite his Holy Spirit to bring change in your life, you change, or you should. Is that right? Remember the old bumper sticker? If God seems far away, who moved? Probably you. There's a theology that said maybe it was God. And I was speaking last night uh, about the, the veil in the temple. The reason the veil was put there was to protect the people from the presence of God. But the God of this age has blinded the eyes now of people that they don't see the gospel. That's Satan's veil. That's a different thing. But somewhere along the line, we think that fasting will change God. The things that we do, coming to church, putting money on the plate, doing good deeds, being on all our rosters, the things that we do need to do. And listen, I'm a church goer and I believe, I'm a pastor, I believe in people coming to church. Please do not misunderstand me. But coming to church isn't what changes you. It's the word of God, it's the spirit of God that brings change in our lives. The problem is that while these people were trying to impress God, they weren't impressing other people. They were exploiting their workers. They were robbing, they were cheating, they were stealing, they were lying. And no doubt other acts of violence are mentioned in there, so I don't know quite what that meant, but the general tone was this, that although they went to their synagogue or to their temple, although they would pray in Lent, and although they would fast and they would do those things with out, outside humbling, the inside was never changed. He goes on, Isaiah goes on to say that there was still unforgiveness, there was still bitterness, there were still divisions, there were still quarrels within those people as they were seeking God and hoping that God would answer their prayer. In the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught us, he says, amongst other things, forgive us our trespasses. So we'd be looking for forgiveness. But it goes on, actually. The sentence doesn't finish there. It says, as we forgive those who trespass against us. What sort of forgiveness do you want? And Jesus actually explains. It's the only bit of the Lord's Prayer that he explains. He goes on to say, with the same measure that you use, it'll be given to you. If you want to hang on to your bitterness, if you want to keep quarrelling, if you want to keep the little groups happening, then that's fine. That's the way that you'll be rewarded. You're asking for that in your prayer. And, and the people that Isaiah is prophesying to don't get it. They don't understand that the way that they live their lives is polluting their prayer. It's blocking their prayer. Their access to God is finished because they're not dealing with people the way that they should. There's no justice. And we look at the issues at the moment of refugees and particularly of children in detention and things like that that are, that are mind-boggling to conceive of, of sending a child that's been sexually abused back to live with the perpetrator. You wouldn't be allowed to do that in Australia. You couldn't go into a school if you had perpetrated that crime, but they're going to send this boy back to, uh, to the island. I don't know, I'm not here to speak about political issues, but we need to think about these things. These were the problems in Isaiah's day. But the prophet says this, if you extend your soul to the hungry and if you satisfy the afflicted soul, then, and only then, your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness indeed will be like the noonday. God will work that miracle to change you as you begin to obey his word, as you begin to act like a Christian or someone who follows the Lord, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought. Those from amongst you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations and be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of streets to dwell in. You see, genuine Christianity arises from a changed heart. It's not the outside things that demonstrate that you're a Christian, it's the inside. 
and acting with justice, removing the yoke and the barrier. We place incredible burdens on people sometimes to, to have them come to church. We try to mould them into our shape at the door before they get in here. We need to allow, we need to, to involve, to invite people to come in here. Allow the gospel, allow the Holy Spirit to mould them and to shape their character. That's what we're about. We are facilitators of the grace of God. And then our light will shine like the dawn. And then true righteousness will protect us. And the glory of God will be our vanguard in the rear. Then you will call on God. Then God will answer your prayers. If you don't just live for yourselves, but spend yourselves for Jesus, that way the light will shine. Jesus sums up in Matthew in the, in the 20th verse there. He said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. So the law keeping that he'd said, the law will not pass away. But you won't get away with just doing the stuff in the law like that which means you go to the services, you go to the sacrifices you give. It's all set out for you. He said, unless your righteousness exceeds law-keeping, the thou shalt not, you won't even see the kingdom of heaven. And it's tough preaching. Jesus didn't have smooth words there to say to people, to calm them down. It's all right, dear. It'll be okay. It'll only be okay if we get the message. That's what he is saying. These are his words. Jesus had exposed the Pharisees as hypocrites. They had the outward religion. They had the flowing gowns. They had the long names and the titles. They had the best seats at the feasts. They had their hand in other people's pockets to get the money. They had it all sorted out so it worked for them. Jesus said, that's not going to do it. You need to exceed that. You need to allow God to do that change and to live a life which points to Jesus. And that's our challenge this morning. If we want to enter the kingdom of heaven, we need to be reflecting the life of the king in our lives. We need to make Jesus Christ king of kings and lord of lords. We need to do that with our words too. And I'm aware that there's a tradition, I was speaking to uh, a multi-generation Methodist, former Methodist now, um, the other week, and he said, you know, we were taught we had a culture within the church to never speak about our faith in Christ. Well, the fruit of that's fairly evident. We need to get back in the habit of giving glory to God openly, of letting people know that I'm a changed person because of Jesus. If you want healing in your life, let me pray with you in the name of Jesus. If you want salvation from the darkness that's around you, let me pray, let me lead you to Jesus. Let me share the word of God, the living word, Jesus Christ, with you. If you want change, if you want renewal and refreshing, let me pray with you. Let, let us have a confidence to pray in the name of Jesus. That's the way the salt goes out. That's the way the light shines. That's the only way. Jesus was God's choice for mankind. We can't change the message. We've no business watering it down and we've no business allowing our salt to become so insipid that it'll just be thrown out on the ground and considered worthless. We need to bring that sort of revival into our hearts in order that the world will be revived and renewed and have a fresh understanding of the love of God in Christ Jesus for every man and woman and child. Let's pray.